Hi, my name is Michael Guzeff and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Colorado State University. And I've developed this presentation on groundwater and the Ogallala Aquifer. So we'll talk a little bit about the basics of groundwater and then we'll talk about how we apply our knowledge of groundwater and groundwater management to the Ogallala Aquifer, which is one of the largest aquifers in the world and it's in the central part of the United States. Groundwater is an abundant resource. Roughly 1.7 billion people around the world rely on aquifers for a water source for municipal use. From this graphic from the U.S. Geological Survey, you can see that there's an estimated 1 million cubic miles of groundwater in the Earth's crust, whereas there's only about 30,000 cubic miles of water stored in lakes and 300 cubic miles of water stored in the world's streams. One advantage to groundwater resources is that they're relatively still or moving very slowly compared to the world's streams, which can go through, of course, floods and droughts, rapidly changing the amount of water at any one place at any one time. Groundwater occurs, as you'd expect, in the subsurface. It occurs below ground, hence where it's often found is invisible to us at the surface. This is a schematic looking at just a cross-section of surface water, maybe that's a lake or a stream on the right-hand side, and underneath this hill slope you can see that there are two layers indicated here. A sort of unsaturated zone near the surface where we have some water stuck between particles of soil and rocks and so forth, but not a whole lot. The majority is, is air for the most part. And then there's a dashed blue line indicating a water table. Below that water table we expect that the pores are mostly filled with water and we call that the saturated zone. That saturated zone is where we find groundwater and we call that area an aquifer. The definition of an aquifer is a body of saturated rock through which water can easily move. At the surface it is of course bounded at the surface by the land surface itself, we can have the water table rise up to the land surface in which case we'll have water ponding or springs coming out near the surface. Oftentimes it's depressed below the, water, the land surface and that water table um, then defines the upper boundary of where our groundwater is stored. An aquifer at depth might be bounded by bedrock or a harder layer or a clay layer uh, at depth. If we look a little closer at the what's going on in the ground, we see that um, our the subsurface is essentially a mix of rock or soil particles, some gaps in between those particles that contain uh, some air and some water. So you can see on the left hand side we have more fractured material where we've got conduits in between the particles and on the right hand side we have more gravelly setup where the pores are in between the particles touching each other. And one of the things that happens is that inside of these little crevices, the way that we get unsaturated zones, is that there's surface tension, uh, which is a property of the liquid water itself, that will stick water into tight little gaps in between these these soil particles. And so if we try to drain that water via gravity, we end up leaving a little bit behind in these tight locations. Well, where does groundwater come from originally? Is it just generated in the ground? No. In general, groundwater comes from precipitation that infiltrates through the land surface and reaches some depth to collect and form this saturated zone in the aquifer. So on the left hand side you can see this sort of very simple diagram of a water cycle where storm clouds are forming precipitation, that precipitation hits the ground and if it comes too fast the rain is applied faster than the ground can take it up then there may be some runoff that occurs. Alternatively, a lot of that water is going to soak into the surface soils, work its way through sediments, and reach 
the water table and contribute to the water stored in the aquifer. On the right hand side you can now see uh, a different approach to trying to provide water into an aquifer. On the extreme right side we can have natural recharge from streams or lakes. So if the water table on the left hand side as we see is depressed in elevation, that is it's at a lower elevation than a stream or lake in which the aquifer is in contact, we can have water move from the surface water into the ground. In the middle here, uh, towards the right hand side, we have a an injection pipe that is noted where uh, essentially water is being forced into the subsurface um, and this might be a strategy that is required uh, to uh, try to store water in the subsurface for later times of the year or something along that line. We use artificial recharge in a variety of different contexts to try to manage uh, water and sometimes the um, constituents of that water. So I alluded to the fact that water bodies can often act as boundaries to aquifers in the previous slide and here's another example of that. This is uh, an indication of a stream moving through the center of this landscape and we can see that the water table is generally at a lower elevation on both sides of the stream in the subsurface. What we would expect then is that water would leave the stream and work its way toward the water table contributing to groundwater in the local aquifer here but we can also have the opposite. We could have water tables that are fairly high compared to the elevation of water in a stream channel or a lake or an ocean, in which case we expect that the flow of water is from the groundwater, from the aquifer, towards the surface water body. So streams, lakes, oceans, other surface water bodies can act as both sinks and sources of groundwater. Let's look at a simple example of how we figure out the shape of the water table and the direction of groundwater flow. So in panel A here, you can see a bunch of circles that are shown. These are meant to represent the locations of wells in the real world, and each one of these numbers next to each one of those wells is the notation of the water table elevation as observed in each one of these wells. And this is uh, interpreted in feet above sea level. So you can see in the top right hand corner 152.31 feet above sea level and in the lower left, almost in the lower left corner, we have 121.34. So those are our extremes. All the other wells read somewhere in between. Well we can take those elevations, that distribution in space, and try to predict what the contours or the shape of the water table is. So if we draw in these contours, you can see that we have the 150 foot, 140, 130, and 120 foot contours that come in panel B here, and that gives us the shape of the water table. Now we expect that this is much like the topography of the landscape. If you looked at a topographic map, we are going from um, high elevation water table in the upper right hand corner to a much lower elevation, a drop of 30 feet or so as we get to the lower left hand corner. What that means is that we expect that groundwater is flowing from the upper right to the lower left. So our groundwater flow lines are going to flow or be in the direction that is perpendicular to these contours. So in general, groundwater flows from locations of high water tables to locations of lowered water tables. And so the flow lines that we would expect to draw would come in in, in panel C. So how do we use groundwater as a resource? Well, we have to pump it if we want to use it in a variety of places that are away from the natural discharge locations. Natural discharge locations could be places like we see in uh, the interactions with, with surface water bodies, as we talked about earlier, but it can also be in seeps and springs that occur in a variety of places. Often what we need to do is pump water to a place where we want it because those are very far from seeps and springs or surface water bodies. So let's look at this example of two wells adjacent to two homes that might be using these 
wells for domestic water use. Uh, you can see that the, the well on the left is a deep well that goes down through a couple of layers. The upper aquifer is a sand and gravel aquifer, and then we have what's called a low permeability till, which means that we end up with uh, water not moving very fast through um, very tight materials, and then we're into this low yield fractured bedrock aquifer. So the well on the left is pulling water from a very deep location compared to the well on the right. The well on the right is shallower, it stays above the low permeability till, and so the water that is being accessed by the well on the right is from that near surface aquifer of sand and gravels, and one of the things that you can see is that the water table becomes deformed around that well on the right. The reason that we have a deformation in the water table is simply because we are pulling water through the well and causing a depression, local depression of the water table, and that's, that influence slowly changes as we move away from the well. Therefore, we end up with something called the cone of depression. The cone of depression is to say, to indicate that the water table would be at a higher elevation if we didn't have this well in place that was pulling water from a deeper location. Let's go back to the well on the left. You'll notice that there is no cone of depression in that well, and the reason for that is because there is a disconnect between that surficial aquifer, the sand and gravel aquifer, and the one from which that well is pulling water, which is below the low permeability till. So there's not a strong communication between the suction of water very deep and that very surficial aquifer uh, near the surface. Well, what if we have more than one well, and they're both in the same aquifer? Well, essentially we can think about the cone of depression of each one of those wells adding together. So in the top panel, what you can see is uh, an indication of the influence of each one of those wells by themselves. But in reality, when we add those two effects together, we end up with something like the profile in the lower panel, which indicates that our cone of depression is a combined cone of depression. We end up coming from the left to the right to well A. We have sort of that natural drawdown. It's actually exacerbated a bit by the fact that well B is so close. And then between well A and well B, we have a very depressed water table because both of those wells are sucking water from the bottoms of the wells. And then we have a slow elevation change as we move back towards those uh, more natural water table towards the right of well B. So we could imagine that having fields and fields of wells could provide a lot of depression of the water table. And it could be in very complex configurations dictated by the spatial distribution of wells at the surface. Well, we've been talking a lot about water table and where water comes from to contribute to an aquifer, but if we put all this together, the storage in an aquifer, the amount of water that we expect is available for use by pumping, uh, is dependent on how much water comes in and how much water is pumped out. So we can think of this as a balance between recharge of water to the, the water table, to the subsurface from precipitation, and withdrawal from pumping. So if we think of it as a, a big underground storage location of water, then the volume of what's stored is growing and shrinking based on the balance of these two inputs and outputs, essentially. In this figure from a recent paper that was published in Nature, we see a comparison between the aquifer areas and the groundwater footprints for use of water from those aquifers. So if we have a high or large aquifer footprint, but a small aquifer area, the authors are indicating here that there is a significant groundwater stress compared to the reverse. So on the left hand side you can see this color scale indicates groundwater stress being the ratio of the groundwater footprint 
where it's being used compared to the aquifer area. So for example, we see the western Mexico aquifer area and groundwater footprint. Groundwater footprint is quite a bit larger than the aquifer area, and therefore it has high groundwater stress with this red indication here. The High Plains Aquifer, or also known as the Ogallala Aquifer, that we'll talk about more in a few minutes, is indicated in the second arrow here, and we see that it has somewhere between 5 and 10 as the ratio of the groundwater footprint to the actual area of the aquifer underneath. And then you can see some of these other ratios worldwide. What we see on the upper right hand side of this figure is a distribution of the many aquifers that were evaluated and their groundwater stress levels from left being low to right being very high, greater than 20.